as you already have known know and guess, I'm not in great form today, so I apologise in advance for that. But uh, I'm still uh, myself working through a lot of my feelings, um, my personal feelings about myself. And uh, that's been coming up a lot over the last week, but with not much time to actually process it because we've been so busy doing different things. So, so that gets me into this state where I'm not as clear as I could be. So hopefully tonight I'll deal with some things and uh, tomorrow might be a different day. But uh, let's get back to the processing the addictions. I want to give you basically uh, just a series of tools, if you like, that can help you work your way through addictions and uh, get yourself to the causal emotion. The first, first step is I want to know all of my addictions. The truth is that the majority of us don't really want to know any of our addictions. <laughs> because what we really want is for our addictions to be met by somebody else rather than having to come face to face with the fact that we've got some. Right? So this, this first step requires quite a lot of prayer. And, about, and when I say prayer, remember prayer is a sincere desire or longing directed towards God. So, so let's say I can see, oh well, yeah, I have some really strong aversion inside of myself to knowing all of my own addictions. So what we do firstly is we start talking to God about that. So start saying to God, well, yes, I've really got a strong aversion to knowing about I don't really want to know them. That's the truth. Like I don't really want to know them. I can see that because I don't really want to know them, then I can't get closer to you. So I can see that it's interfering with my relationship. But I can see also that I somehow need to generate some kind of a desire to know my own addictions. Does that make sense? So what I would do is in my prayer to God under those circumstances is talk to God about how you can generate a desire to know your addictions and why you are so afraid about knowing them. Now, one of the biggest reasons why we have fear associated with knowing our addictions is because once we do know them, we will feel a feeling of self-disgust. Is that how you spell disgust? Um, or you could call it shame. Now, to give you an idea of what kind of shame you may be facing, um, let's imagine for a moment that your wife or husband has accused you of sexually, sexually um, projecting at other people. So let's say you're um, the husband and your wife has said to you, oh, you sexually project at other women all the time. So that's what they're saying to you. Now, if we look at that from an energetic perspective, from an emotional perspective, in it, and this is something that I did bring up in the first century, by the way, and it was just as confronting to the people who then as what this you're going to probably find it confronting now but every time I sexually project at another person I am actually entering a physical sexual relationship with that person huh? in fact in the first century I said just by looking at her in that way you have committed adultery with her that's what I said then and actually, from a soul perspective, this is what's happening. Here's my soul. Here's their soul. I'm projecting sexually. There's a sexual emotion coming from me towards them. And if they accept that, that enters them. So it is actually a physical sexual interaction. And what do we do here on the planet? We go, oh, well, I didn't touch her. And, you know, it doesn't matter how you get your appetite as long as you eat at home and all that kind of stuff. These are all the justifications. But the reality is that there's a sexual thing going on. At the soul level, and I'll, I'll put it this bluntly, at the soul level, I'm fondling her and she's fondling me. Right? So a lot of times we don't consider that. We wouldn't consider that I'm fondling her sexually and she's fondling me sexually just by having this sexual interaction happening. Now, 
Now, once you come to terms with that emotionally, which is a pretty thing, big thing, isn't it, to come to terms with emotionally, one of the first emotions we feel is a judgment of it and we go into self-disgust and self-shame. We become ashamed of our own behaviour. Now, it's often our fear of the shame that causes us to not want to know all of our addictions. We, we don't want to see ourselves as we really are. But you see, to be at one with God, we need to see ourselves as we really are. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. Now, God doesn't feel disgusted at you. But God does notice you fondling every woman that you project at. Does that make sense? Or every man you project at sexually. God does notice that as a sexual interaction, as an actual sexual interaction that's actually occurring. God, that's what God sees. We don't judge it that way because the physical act isn't happening. And so we then justify it. But from God's perspective, that's what's going on. So what I need to do is go, all right, I have to deal with the fact that there are some things inside of me that I am going to personally judge as disgusting or shameful. Now, the actual action of, dis of judging myself and calling those things disgusting and shameful is actually in itself an error that I do need to release at some point. But it is certainly not loving to have constant sexual interactions that are based on addiction with many women, is it? It's not a loving act. So obviously we need to deal with that. So when it comes to I want to know all of my addictions, the biggest impediment to knowing all of them is our fear of how it's going to make us feel. Does that make sense to everyone? And, and if, you can be, if you can go and, and pray a lot to God about the fact that you are capable and God built you to be able to feel all of your emotions, then you will have far less fear about what may come up when you see what you do. Right. And so my suggestion is really focus on firstly, do I want to know all of my addictions? Pray about that. And by the way, with every one of these steps I'm going to raise with you, prayer for me is, is a core part of every one of these steps. A core part of every one of these steps that I'm going to list is prayer. So, so, so in other words, having a sincere, being in a sincere place in that. See, I can say, I can say, I want to know all of my addictions. And, uh, and then someone comes along and tells you, oh, did you realise that you do this all the time? No, I don't see that. No? Well, they give you a few examples. You say, oh, no, I still don't see that. No? What's happening now? You're saying you want to know all of your addictions and you get an opportunity through the law of attraction that somebody brings one of them to you and what do you do? You reject it. So do you really want to know all of your addictions? You'd be better off saying, I don't want to know any of my addictions. Talk to God about that. Does that make sense? Be truthful that whether you do want to know or not. Most of the time, we are not very truthful with ourselves. A lot of times, we, we don't want to know. So be truthful with God about that. The truth is, God, I know this is affecting our relationship, but the truth is that I don't really want to know what I'm really like because I'm scared to death of it. Like... What if I'm really bad? What if, what if there's an emotion inside of me that's like pedophilia? What if that's there? How's that going to feel? Or what if there's an emotion inside of me that's like, you know, that I feel like murdering people really? Like one lady I was talking to, we, we were talking for a while and she said, no, I haven't got anything inside of me. I'm pretty fine, I think. And then after about half an hour, she said, actually, now that I feel about it, I would like to get a gun and shoot everybody on this planet. Now that's a big progression from not having any. <laughs> right. So, so the truth is that that emotion must have been in her for her to get to the point of voicing that. But we can be so totally oblivious. Now, of course, does anyone want to feel that emotion? Probably not, hey. Most of us would say, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to feel that emotion and judge anybody who does. Like, so 
it, oh, I, don't know, I was going to bring up something in Mary's workshop again, and I know she's a bit. Is she sitting down there? there? She's, she's outside. Yeah, she's processing at the moment. So, um, there was an exercise that you will learn about in the workshop that uh, actually brings you face to face with some very dark feelings that you have inside of you towards other people. And if you really go with it, you'll learn a lot about yourself. So I think I can get away with saying that, that I just said, rather than telling you what the exercise is. Um, but if you, if you bear that in mind, that often we don't want to know our addictions because we're so afraid of the darkness within. Now, God doesn't judge this darkness that's within. We are judging it, but God doesn't judge it. Like God still loves you unconditionally, even with this darkness within. Right? But we need, if we want to be closer to God and also closer to ourselves, we need to know what it is and release it from ourselves. And that's going to require some courage on our part. Does that make sense? Yeah. Peter, you'd like to... Is there microphones around? Just straight behind you, Graham. If you keep your hand up to yourself. Thanks. AJ, um, when you say uh, God loves us all unconditionally, mm -hmm. and then there's the, uh, the whole situation about us drawing uh, divine love into our souls, mm -hmm. can you just talk about those two differences? Uh, they're not different. So let's firstly look at what's going on. Here's God. Here's our soul, or here's us. God loves us, so this is me. God loves me unconditionally and totally desires for me to feel that love that God has for me all the time. So God has a strong longing, 100% of the time, to give you her love without conditions. So there's no conditions. You don't, can't earn it. It's a gift that she wants to give you. But... What's happening inside of us emotionally is we are blocked to receiving it. And our blockages are under the control of our will. So for, to give you an example, if I feel really bad about myself, it's very hard for me to let somebody else love me without me crying. Does that make sense? Like, it's very hard. Like, if, if I feel really bad about myself, like I'm a disgusting person, and somebody comes along and says, oh, I really love you. You're a beautiful person. <laughs> If I'm connected with my emotions, I will probably instantly just burst out crying. Actually, five minutes ago, that happened. Uh, I was outside, somebody, came, somebody was sitting there and they asked me to spend a bit of time with them and then they felt bad about that and I said, actually, I love you as my own daughter. Right? And she just burst out crying. <laughs> and she's still outside crying, actually. Um, so why does that happen? Because we inside don't feel, we feel rejecting of that. We, we, can't, we can't contemplate that, that, that somebody loves us in that way. So, so what actually happens inside of us emotionally, and this is where the emotional work obviously is important, is it's like we've got a blockage, blocking God's love that's always there ready to flow into us, but we've got all of these blockages of letting it flow into us. Can you see that? One of those blockages might, not, might be, I don't want to be open and vulnerable. So you, you, you try being in a love relationship with someone who's not vulnerable. Does it work very well? You know, you, you, say, you, you try to give them some love and they think, that you, they think that you're giving it because you want something in return. And, you know, there's all these different things that they think that your love is even though it's just a pure gift. And what we're doing with God is the same thing. We've basically got this haze of all of these emotional injuries that cause us to reject the flow of love into us. So while God has all this love for us and it is unconditional, we ourselves, using our own will, reject the flow of that love into ourselves. And because God honours our free will, he honours that we are rejecting his love. In other words, he, he doesn't force our soul to receive that love until we decide we wish to. And that's where our longing becomes a part of it. If I long for it, now my soul becomes open and vulnerable, now I'm ready to receive. 
The problem is with longing is a lot of our longing is distorted. And I've given that example quite frequently where how, you know, you start out with a longing. So in other words, let's say that there's a, let's say Mary's on the other, this happened to me when I first met Mary, right? It's exactly this happened to me. I was sitting in the room, Mary was over in the corner, I'm feeling there's my soulmate. It's like, like, for a start, it's not just there's my soulmate, it's like, this girl I've been hanging out for, for 40 years and there she is. Like, first, very first time I met her, again for 40 years, I've got all these feelings and la, 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 just, but, but I go, what do I do? What do I do? And my own unworthiness prevented me from just going straight up to her and saying, Mary, you're my soulmate. <laughs> and I've been waiting for you for 40 years. Like, my own unworthiness prevented that. So what did I do instead of that? I'm standing like, I don't know what to do. And, and she, she comes up, she, she wants to talk to me. And I don't know what to say. But basically what's happening is my own feelings are interfering with the possible transaction. Now, Mary said to me since that she wished that the very first time I met her that I actually went up and said that to her, you know. But, but, and, and in one point in time she was quite upset with me that I didn't um, because I eventually finished up through a series of events I told some, somebody else found out, right, D due to my own feelings when I was home and there was visitors at home and so forth. And somebody else found out. Then somebody else found out. Then somebody else found out. And then that somebody else told Mary's parents. And then Mary's parents finished up telling Mary. Right? And all of that happened because I felt unworthy and I rejected it. I rejected it, not her. She didn't even know what was going on really So at that point. So this is what we have going on with God a lot. We are in this constant place of rejection of God's love flowing into us and that's why we need to go through these other things. So that barrier diminishes as we pray and ask for divine love and as we clear our own emotional state. Yep, it's like sort of Lessening it, lessening it even further, lessening it even further. And as soon as the last barrier goes, at that moment you will be at one with God. Because the love from God, if you long for it, will constantly be flowing into your soul. So at that moment where there's no more barriers, you will actually be at that moment at one with yeah. God. From that moment on, God's love will be flowing into, into you like a constant stream of water being poured into your soul. And you'll never be without it you'll never feel apart from God after that point. It'll just keep flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So it just requires a bit of work in between. <laughs> You're starting to laugh about the bit of work because you still don't believe that it's a bit of work really. And can I just point out to you before I answer more questions, that actually there's only seven spheres of development till at one with God. There are 14 spheres of development that we know of at this point after that. So what does that tell you? That at least only a third of your problems in your life are going to be, by, by the time you're at one with God, a third, of your, a third of the issue is going to be gone, but there's a lot more truth to learn and after that it will all be joyful. So we're just going through this painful part because of the first seven spheres of crap that we've got to work out through the, through the human condition. And it feels hard because if we're the first group of the first people, part of the group of the first people doing it, we have the resistance of the rest of the world to work against in the process. And that, that makes it quite difficult, along with our own addictions. Well, they, they, when we say our own addictions, we're talking about everyone's addictions in the universe, including the spirits that are around us. They just have addictions too. They're no different to us. Now, there were lots of hands that all of a sudden all went down. Um, can we go right up the back? It's not very often that you get asked right up the back. <laughs> Thank you, AJ. I think all what you've talked about this morning, I've been going through in the last few days, like really in my face. And... I know at some stage I did long to see more. Question being, if, and sometimes I, I listen in my heart and I go, oh, that might have a bit of truth in it, but you, you sometimes get around my father, I'll be specific, very negative, very opinionated. 
I do find I have the emotion of anger and I go, okay, and he's very, very judgmental, always has been. And what I find is that when you're trying to look at your addictions, when do you actually learn the difference between the people that are really, truly telling you with loving their heart and the people that are just plain dealing with their own judgments and beliefs? Um, well, firstly, everyone is just really dealing with their own judgments and beliefs. Um, but let's look at what you just said as, we, as you said what you said. You said you're talking about your father and he is. Can you just keep... Can we go back to that? Oh, he's very judgmental and opinionated. <laughs> and he's very um, negative in a lot of ways. Like this. Can you see why you say he is? You're not actually looking at what I am. Can you see that for a start? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all of those things. Now, how many of you would feel upset about a person like that? It, frankly, no. Most of us, right? Okay. So, so my response, so this is my response. What's my response? What would you feel if you had, had a father like that? What's the first thing most of us would probably feel? Anger, yeah. Most of us feel angry. Right. How dare he be judgmental towards me? How dare, you know, he's always opinionated. He doesn't ever listen to my opinion, you know? Like, and negative, like, you know, I try to do something positive in my life and what does he say about it? He just craps on it, you know? So, yeah, I'm upset about that. Now, remember what we said earlier. Every time we feel anger, we are in, or we are living in an addiction. And our addiction is not getting met. So, my angry, judgmental, opinionated, negative father for some reason, isn't meeting my addictions. Right. What would be the addiction I would have, do you feel? What, what might be the addiction that I have? What do I want to feel from him instead of those feelings is what I need to look at. Uh, so let's look at the opposite. We want to we feel from him instead of angry, what do we want to feel? Peace, peaceful with him, right, let's say. Peace. Instead of judgmental, what do we want to feel? Acceptance. Ex acceptance. Even if we're wrong, we'd like to have acceptance. Uh, okay. Opinionated. Instead of feeling an opinionated man, what would we rather feel? So he listens to me, right? So he listens or listens to my opinions. My opinions. Instead of negative, what would we like him to be? Positive. Okay. There's my addictions. <laughs> you laugh. You say, you say, hang a sec, hang a sec. AJ, are you saying that me wanting peace in my life is an addiction? And I'm saying, yeah, that's actually true. And you're saying, hang a sec, you're saying that me wanting acceptance is an addiction. And I'm saying, yeah, actually, that's true too. And what about someone listening to me? Everybody wants someone listening to me. Yeah, everyone's in an addiction with it. And... Everyone wants you to be positive all the time. Right? Yeah, that's an addiction too. So all of these addictions cover over something. Because, because I know that I'm wrong because my initial response was anger. And if my initial response is anger, is anger loving? No. So what would happen if I was in a loving space and this angry, judgmental, opinionated, negative man comes up to me? If I was in a loving space with him, what would happen? Oh, I'd give him a hug and say, I love your angry, judgmental, opinionated <laughs> self, right? But, you know, I don't know if I want to spend much time with you, but that's the way it goes. But you wouldn't feel this terrible feelings about it, would you, inside of yourself, do you think? You'd feel, if you're at one with God, do you feel, would you feel like going, oh, you're a terrible man, you're stupid, you know, would you start projecting back at him? You wouldn't, would you? So the fact that I am means he is doing these things and in my law of attraction, and of course he's, if he's my father, he's created a lot of my law of attraction anyway, he's in this to expose my addictions regarding these areas. So 
What about my addiction to peace? When, when things are peaceful, what do I feel? Safe, secure. So can you see I'm starting to identify that I've got, must have some fears about an angry person making me feel unsafe. Why would an angry person make me feel unsafe? If I was at one with God, would I ever feel unsafe? Of course I wouldn't. Because when you're at one with God, it's like God's on your side. Who, do you, who else do you need on your side, really? If the creator of the universe is on your side, like, does it matter if nobody else is? Of course not, right? So the fact that it does means that I have some fear to process about a lack of peace. So that's probably related to something in my childhood about dad being angry and I was afraid and, you know, he brought home with him angry spirits perhaps and it was well and not only was he angry but there's all these spirits that are angry as well all projecting at me and I'm feeling frightened little child and I want him now to stop doing that. I want him to stop being angry and start being peaceful so I don't have to feel this angry, this, sorry, afraid little child that's in me. And that's what I, so I project at him. Don't, don't you be angry with me. Don't you be angry with me. You get angry with me, I'm going to get angry with you for, for, not being safe, for me not feeling safe anymore. Can you see that? So it's like, so really what's happening is every time you list something about the other person, you're really wise if you can also make a list about what the addictions are. That why have you noticed all of these things in this other person? It's not so much you noticing them, it's that you're angry about them, which tells you that you must have an addiction. Like it's one thing to notice them. Yes, I agree. I, when, I, when I feel through you to your dad, yes, I agree he is all those things. Mind you, he isn't all those things. He has those injuries, is more like what I would put it. He has all those injuries, I agree. Right. Yeah, and that's the thing, AJ, I think, because there's times where he can carry on and I can just sit there really peaceful. And I hadn't necessarily looked at... There's times it's, it's a very uh, physical thing in me because it's the physical starting and then I tune in and go, what's the matter? And I'm, I'm, I can feel so much anger. And I think when it's like the Deserata, people that are vexation to the spirit, they say move. And I've had times where people have been really violently in a rage and... I have just been so calm and something comes mm. over me. But, but can I suggest to you that you often in, in violently angry situations go out of body. In other words, you detune from the situation, right? Many of us do this automatically. So, so my suggestion is in a next violently angry situation that you have, which I'm sure you must be still attracting, um, allow yourself to stay in your body and see how you feel bodily. Well, that I did once and... It was all completely like a little electrodes going off in my body all the time and exactly. I kept thinking, what do I do? What you do is breathe and feel it. Breathe and feel it. Breathe and feel it. Diaphragmatically breathe and just keep feeling it. Okay. Right? And the, the second question following on to that is when you are sensitive or mediumistic and I go in mostly with the men and you go in and you're friendly and you're happy and like you're saying, you can feel that after a while, you can feel that sexual fondling going on and it's like, hang on, this is really not where I'm coming from and yeah. I just don't know what to do with that. I usually withdraw or disappear or, and I haven't physically dealt with it because yep. I can feel it and that's not what I want. So what we need to do is find out what's underneath that. So we'll go through this process because we haven't got as much time now because we've started a bit late. We'll go through the process of all the different things that we can do to get to the point of where we're actually feeling our causal emotion. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. But can everybody see how when you make a list of other people's stuff, you are also making at the same time a list of your own addictions really? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So, oh, the woman doesn't listen to me. So what's my addiction? I want the woman to listen to me. What's underneath that? I probably wasn't listened to as a child from my mother. Do you see how there's a whole link of things there? You know, the, uh, the woman doesn't find me sexually attractive. I'm not sexually attractive. Why, why is that? There's got to be something about my dad or my mum in amongst all of that. Like my mum might have suppressed sexuality, which meant that I had to suppress mine. Or my dad might have been overtly sexual and I was ashamed of him. And so I've tuned out of my own sexuality as a result. 
But with every single list we make about the other person that annoys us and makes us upset and angry, it is covering the actual list inside of ourselves of our addiction. So, what's the next thing we need to do? So the first thing you notice is an attitude, isn't it? It's a desire that needs to grow. The desire of wanting to know about it. And, and the desire of no matter how shameful it makes me feel, no matter how disgusting it makes me feel, no matter how afraid of it I am, I want to know. We need to develop this desire within us to know. All right. So what do we do next? After we've developed a desire in us to know, what I would suggest to do as a, as a tool is to make a list of everything that makes you, and I'll put makes in quotation marks there, you angry. Angry. Now, definition of anger, slight annoyance, mild frustration, <laughs> frustration, annoyance, right? Feeling that you're being controlled, manipulated, all those things are all part of the anger-based emotion. So anything that gives you a mild annoyance, anything that gives you mild frustration, all of those things, write them all down. Because in underneath any every one of them is an expectation. So that's the next thing. Define your expectations. Remember that all expectations, now remember this, all, 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 all expectations. The expectation you have to be loved, that's an unloving expectation too. The expectation you have that somebody doesn't treat you badly, that's an expectation that's unloving in you too. Does that make sense? All expectations, all, are unloving. What kind of expectations does God have of you? Zero. Yep. And when you're at one with God, you will have zero. Imagine living with a person with no expectations. Wouldn't that be pretty amazing? You don't have to do anything for them, anything to them to be loved. It's pretty amazing that, isn't it? Well, the truth is you're living with one every day and you're rejecting him. God's, God's that person. Yeah. So, we, see, we, we, we don't want that. We don't want that a lot of the times. We reject that a lot of the times. We think we want it, but we keep pushing it away. So, define all of your expectations. Your anger tells you your expectations. Your annoyances, frustrations and all those, they all tell you your expectations. So you define your expectations. You, you see, the reason why is that you're not going to look at any of them emotionally until you admit to yourself you've got them, are you? Well, you know, you're just going to skip over them completely all the time. We, if we define them, if we write them down, we, we know what makes us angry, so therefore we know what our expectations are. I expect a man loves me. I expect the woman to put dinner on the table at 6.30. I, I, you know, our expectations can be physical, or emotional, or spiritual for that matter, can't they? And all of them are going to be unloving, but we need to define them, we need to see what they are. Remembering they're all unloving. Now, this isn't a judgment of me, this is just the truth. All expectations are unloving because God doesn't have expectations of me. God doesn't expect anything of me, so therefore, any time I expect something of another person, I am being unloving. It's just quite that simple. And it's not a judgment, it's just a statement of truth. So instead of judging myself about how unloving I've been, so, so you know, we start writing our expectation list. Oh, yeah, I expect that, I expect that, I expect that. Oh, yeah, I expect that, too, I expect that. And over the page, I expect that, <laughs> over the page. And, and after you get to six or seven or eight pages of them, you start going, gee, where's like, gee, what kind of person am I? Like, remember I said you might have a thousand addictions? 
or, 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 or two. <laughs> Every one of those addictions <laughs> cover over an expectation. They're, they're driven by an expectation. So I'm starting to get to like the eighth page and if there's 25 a page, you know, that's like 200 and I'm starting to feel like, yeah, there's no one who wants to know any more about me. <laughs> you know, that's a judgment. I'm now in judgment of myself. Because the truth is all of my expectations usually were created in my childhood by my environment, right? So by me getting all down upon myself about what I've now got inside of myself, I'm really judging myself and that's not helpful either. I just need to be truthful about what's there. Do you follow? Like, just allow yourself to be truthful. So I've now defined my expectations and I've now realised yeah, they're all unloving even though most of them feel like they're not unloving. We go like that, don't we? Well, how can that be unloving? You're telling me that no, that doesn't sound right to me. Like, I know it's unloving, but I should still have, be able to have it. You know, like, and we ha have all of this blame thing going on. I said, so when, when we start talking to people about their emotions, oftentimes they're saying, but, but, the, but the other person yelled at me. They yelled at me. I say, yeah, I know. And you're unloving right now. But, but they yelled at me. Why aren't you saying they're unloving? I just said, well, they are unloving. But you're unloving right now too. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And we're happy to see, we want the person to point out the other person's stuff, but we're not very happy to look at our own stuff, right? So the beauty of doing this is we're starting to have an openness and a humility to look at our own stuff. And that's a very powerful tool with your connection with God. You see, the primary thing that prevents you from receiving divine love is the fact that we're unwilling to look at our own stuff. So wouldn't it pay to look at our own stuff as a high priority? Of course. So that's why you know, these kind of things, these kind of tools are helpful. Well, so we, we've prayed about wanting to know all of our addictions. We've written down as part of the exercise everything that makes us angry. We realise everything that makes us angry is linked to an expectation. So let's start writing down all of our expectations. So we write all of them down. We're now sitting there thinking, shit. I'm a shock. I'm terrible. I'm bad. Well, now we're out of harmony with our love of self as well. And that's another addiction. Why do you want to punish yourself? Because probably because you were punished in your childhood and you just want to keep it going. And that's an addiction too. What we need to do is stop punishing ourselves and start getting real with ourselves. We punish ourselves so we can avoid punishment from others. Or feeling bad, of course. Yep. But the main reason why we punish ourselves is, that, is because we're avoiding punishment from others. The, the, the addiction in the childhood is, if I as a child recognise what's wrong with me before mum and dad do, then when mum and dad want to hit me, I'll have already gone through it emotionally and worked it all out and they won't feel like hitting me anymore. Right? So we have a lot of addictions based around that. But let's keep going. So we do that, we do that, we do that. We are yet really to process emotion, except for perhaps the emotion of I'm bad. <laughs> We're probably in that by this stage, right? So what do we do next? What do we do? We need to get somehow from the expectation into the emotional reason why we have the expectation. What? Fear, make a list if you want, what fear causes the expectation? Now for many of us, by the way, when you get to the stage of defining your expectations, many of you will automatically get into emotions many times. Because, because just the process of actually describing the expectations to yourself opens you up emotionally and you start actually connecting to why you have those expectations and that often straight away triggers you emotionally. <clears throat> but if it doesn't, if we make a list about the fears related to the expectations. So I have an expectation that a woman makes my dinner at 6pm every night. So what's the fear under that expectation? The woman's demonstrating to me through making my meal that she loves me. 
right? That's what I feel, obviously. But initially, I might not even get that deep. I might just say, the meal should be on my ta table at 6 o'clock. That's when I get home from work, right? Or that's when I want to, want to eat. So my expectation is that I want to eat at 6 o'clock. Why do I want to eat at 6 o'clock? There's got to be some reason why I want to eat at 6 o'clock. Could be simple like mummy fed me at 6. It could be that. And why is it from a woman that I need to be fed? Why can't a man make the meal? <laughs> She's got breasts. <laughs> uh, ladies, there's very little emotions related to the fact that you've got breasts. Trust me. You don't believe that. <laughs> Well, every, remember, every emotional addiction enters us when we're not in a state, generally, to even be in intellectually cognizant of what's occurring. So does the child know mummy's got a breast when, when the, the child is, like, just born? No, it doesn't know. All it's doing is feeling the nurturing from mummy, isn't it? So, so when you go to me, uh, you know, it's because of women's breasts or something I wasn't nurtured when I was little. That's just an intellectual argument you're using. The truth is at the time that you were being suckled by your mother, you did not have even the intellectual awareness of what was occurring. So then how can you know that it's about that now? The truth is you would just feel an emotion. And if you're not feeling an emotion and you think, oh, this is all about me not being suckled by my mum with her breast, it's all about a spirit telling you what they think the emotion is. And it's certainly not the actual emotion. The actual emotion will be, I wasn't nurtured. And that's got nothing to do with breasts. Do you see what I'm saying? It's got, you can be nurtured from a male just as much as you can be nurtured by a female, and it's got nothing to do with a woman's breasts. Sorry. Just, I'm just trying to confront a lot of your new age belief systems, right? <laughs> anyway, let's get back to this one. What, causes the, what fear causes the expectation? So underneath the fear of like coming home, not a meal on the table. I've been working all day and my woman... Can you feel that anger coming out of me now? My woman has not made my meal. She doesn't even care enough about the fact that I have been working all day for her. <laughs> now, now that's the underlying... So that, that anger obviously covers a fear. So what's the fear that causes that? Well, the fear is that she doesn't love me. My woman actually doesn't love me. Isn't that the fear? And, and you feel she's just demonstrated it. She's demonstrated it by not having the meal ready at the time that you feel it should be ready. So, so what uh, emotion am I uh, avoiding? I'm avoiding feeling unloved by my wife. I feel unloved by my wife. And instead of saying, actually, darling, I feel unloved by you in that moment, what we normally do instead is we get upset and angry because we don't even want to feel the feeling of being unloved in that real situation right there and then. Does that make sense? But if we could learn to voice, voice it, actually, I feel unloved right now. And she says, yeah, go with that, go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see where that takes you. Um, because the truth is, She's made 365 meals for you this year already. <laughs> like, like if you're not feeling loved after that, something's wrong, right? <laughs> so, so, so you let yourself feel... She says, yeah, go with that, go with that. So you're feeling unloved, you're feeling unloved. And eventually, if you just allow yourself to actually just feel the feeling in that present moment. So you don't have to go seeking for any childhood stuff here. All, you need, all we're feeling at this moment is my wife, someone who says she loves and cares for me, doesn't love or care for me. That's what I feel right now. That's what I'm feeling right now. And she, if she was in a good place, would actually allow me to go down this track emotionally. Actually, I'm feeling like you don't love me right now. 
you know, I've been working all day, you know, I feel quite exhausted. And I, you know, after working all day, I don't really feel like coming home and making my own meal. You haven't been working all day, so half of the day you're out with your, you know, let's say we're not, we're not got children. Half the day you're out with your girlfriends and the other half of the day you went swimming and, and um, you know, and you did some of your art in the room there. And, and, and because you were so invo involved in that, like I, and I've been working all day for us, you know, and I'm not, so what I'm doing now, can you see what I'm doing? Instead of, instead of going into the rage and anger about the situation, I'm trying now to just connect with, by describing how I'm feeling, I'm trying to connect with the sadness that's inside of me about the issue. Does that make sense? And I'm feeling quite unloved right now. And then, and then all of a sudden what will start happening when you get used to doing this perm, you know, all the time, the emotion itself of sadness will just rise in you and you just start allowing yourself to cry. So you just start crying and, and actually I'm feeling so unloved by you now and, you know, and, and if you start, if you just allow yourself to keep talking and allow yourself to keep feeling the emotion, eventually what will come up is the actual emotion that you feel she doesn't love you in that moment. Now the beauty of doing that is that underneath that will often be the truth something to do with your childhood. But you don't actually have to know what it is at this point. All you need to do is go into owning the actual emotion there and then. Does that make sense? So here I am. I've, I've already done this preliminary work. I want to know all of my addictions. I list everything that makes me angry. I define my, ex define my expectations. And then I look at my fears. So I've done all that intellectually. So I'm at least a little bit open to the whole process now of examining my emotions and examining my addictions. But what I'm saying the next step really is in situation, so in the situation, be completely truthful about how you feel. Now, I just want to define completely tr uh, truthful. Anger is never truthful. Because anger isn't about how you feel, it's about what you're projecting at another person. You're not owning it. When I say anger, like you can be angry and feel it truthfully inside of yourself, but if you do, it'll be a very childlike type of anger. The, tru the truth is for the majority of us, anger is not a truthful condition. We're not being honest with ourselves when we're in anger. We're being in our addiction, remember? Everything that makes us angry is proof of the addiction. And the addiction is not a truthful place in feeling a causal emotion. Right? So, so if I'm in the situation, I need to learn to be completely truthful about how I feel. So in the example I gave, um, I'm really angry with you because you have not cooked my dinner and I'm sick to death of coming home, not having a dinner in front of me and, and off I go. Now is that being truthful? No. Now at the time I'm going to think it is. That's my problem. Because at the time I am in my addiction. Right? And I need to get out of my addictions and get into emotions which are, which are the opposite to the addiction. So in this situation I need to be completely truthful. I just flump on this, you know, flump down on the lounge, you know. So to sit down and I just you, just... you just imagine yourself in a situation where someone's just been unloving to yourself for a moment. And you do this now, where someone's been unloving to you, like where you didn't get what you wanted from them. That's what you feel. So you breathe, right? Close your eyes for a moment maybe. And you breathe. Start voicing out loud how you're feeling. Right? I'm, feeling I'm feeling really upset, actually. So, so you, you start describing how you're feeling. If your partner, I'm running out of batteries, so I'll just put two more in. I've got two here. Um,
we back on? Yes, we are. Now, if, if your partner is used to dealing with emotions, your partner will be very used to you doing this and you'll be used to her doing it too. Um, if you're not used to dealing with emotions, then just inform your partner beforehand. This is the kind of thing you're going to do instead of yelling and screaming at them. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be impressed. Um, <laughs> so what you do instead is you, you allow yourself to breathe and feel and, and start describing to yourself, and, but out loud. See, there's a power in doing it out loud too. There's this real power in doing it out loud because when you're doing it in your head, you're not always connecting to the emotion of it. When you're doing it out loud, you're starting to really let yourself feel the emotion up. So, so you, you're closing your eyes so you're not distracted by everything going on around you and you're starting to feel your emotions. And, you, and they can be there or not, but it'd be lovely for them to be there because there will be something in this for them as well, generally. Because everyone's law of attraction generally finishes up triggering another person. And if both people are open enough, you can deal with a lot of things emotionally. So when myself and Mary are going through things, the other person generally is just sitting there listening to what we're going through, right? And allowing us, not projecting at us to do it or anything like that, but just allowing us to voice, voice what's going on. So actually I'm feeling, yeah, I feel really upset and angry actually. So you allow yourself to shake and feel the anger that you feel. Right? So, so, all right, so I feel really angry and frustrated actually. And so about coming home to no dinner, right? So you feel really angry. And then you'll start very rapidly generally feeling that anger and connecting what it's about. It's about the fact that there's no dinner on the table and, um, and how does that feel, you know? What, what does that feel? You can ask yourself that question, what does that feel like? Well, well I've been working all day and well, you know, you haven't been working all day and, and, you know, I'm trying to do, I'm working for us and we have to pay the bills and everything else. I feel. So in the end, you know what you might get to? That you actually don't like your job. You might even get to that. It might be something completely unrelated to what you thought it was going to be related to and that you're just sick and tired of working in this job and you're so distressed about it that you haven't got a job you love that by the time you come home you're just physically exhausted with the distress of not having a job you love. It might be just that simple that, that, uh, that the emotion that comes up. But if you allow yourself to connect to it and allow yourself to breathe and allow yourself to feel it in the situation, you'll get to a point where you start feeling the emotion if you do that all the time. But it's about being truthful. This is not about being you know, in an angry space yelling at somebody. It's about being truthful with what's going on inside of yourself. And Mary wants to say something. Could someone give her a mic? Thanks. Uh, I, I was just giving you a little indicator at some time when you're done. Are you... Go away. Go away. Uh, I just, for me, because I've had many addictions that were not based on causal emotion, causal grief, mm -hmm. uh, so I really had to... Oh, sorry, I'll come up here. Thanks, darling. We want to address the audience. Mary's learning to address the audience <laughs> rather than me <laughs> in an interaction. Um, for myself, I had to really desire to see the truth of what was occurring also. Um, I see many people with addictions trying to, um, so in this example, process that their mother didn't love them. When uh, the truth may be that their father just had um, an arrogant viewpoint to women. And that is actually the false belief that needs to be released. So very often with addictions, there's not, there is a causal pain, but sometimes there's not a causal pain. There's just a false belief that was created within us, mm -hmm. which is an error, which if you think about it, all of our causal pain is just an error that we are releasing. It's, a, it's an erroneous emotion that we believe to be the truth. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, and I'm bringing this up because I know for... Um, AJ has had more addictions based on, has had very few addictions, but addictions based on causal grief. Mm. But I have actually had more addictions, well, in both camps. Some of them were based around um, feeling that if a man loves me, he will do certain things for me. That came from an error in my relationship with my dad that wasn't related to th him not doing things for me. It was related to him to doing lots of things for me. So does everyone understand that distinction that I'm making there? Um, so I had to really pray about seeing the truth of what was happening in these interactions. Yeah. 
So uh, can everyone see that what Mary's bringing up is important in that many of our addictions were created in us because we became spoilt children? Where we had our mother or our father do all sorts of things for us and, and eventually we learned how to manipulate them into doing it and how to control them to do it and all those kind of things. And, we, and we've grown up with them, with it happening, often because of their own emotional injuries, but we've grown up with these expectations that are all unloving and we need to give them up. Yep. Yeah. And also if we've grown up in an environment that has a lot of prejudice within it, uh, we can take that on as truth. It's a, an error that we believe is truth. So men are better than women, uh, black people are worse than white people. They're all error-based beliefs that create addictions that we have to release. And the pain is in, it's like the three-year-old who realises they can't have the lolly. They have to, they are experiencing that pain right then. So right here and now when I realise, oh, gee, um, women aren't better than men, that hurts. Now I've got to feel like, you know, we're equals or whatever. So I have to feel that now. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Does that, that make that sense clear? to everyone? So, so, so a lot of times when you, what you really feel is that actually, like I could, in, a, in the scenario I was giving you earlier, I could be feeling their feeling. Actually, I expect that a woman puts dinner on my table under any circumstance, actually. Like that, that finishes up being what I'm feeling. Actually, I, I, it's a demand. I, I demand that you put, you know, you're a woman, that's your job. How many of you women feel bad about that one? <laughs> Quite a few. Um, so, so it's your job. You've got to do that. That's what I feel. Now, how would that have addiction have been created? Well, you know how it got created? By mum putting dinner on my table every single day and every single night up until I was 18 years of age when I left home. <laughs> and I'm a male. I never saw dad do it. And I never had to do it for myself. So how do I give up that addiction? by firstly feeling the anger of the addiction itself, like there's a lot of rage and expectation in it, and then going in and realising it, actually, actually, um, I'm, I'm the one out of line here. I'm the one with the unloving expectation and addiction. And what do I feel about that? Like, uh, right in this instant, I feel you're unloving to me. You don't put dinner on my table, you're unloving to me. That's how it is, right now. That's, how, that's what I feel. And I may be completely wrong, but I need to feel that. I need to really feel that and connect with that emotionally. And the reason I bring that up is because I feel that's the pain that people resist the most. <laughs> it's because in the, in the interaction, you have to go and cry about you because what has happened is there has been an error about love that has entered you when you're young. And you do have to go and cry about feeling like I'm not being loved even though the truth is you could very well be being loved in that interaction. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, you know when a child doesn't get its lolly and you've taught the child that every time you go shopping you're going to go past the lolly aisle and you'll pick a lolly out for it and then this time the child doesn't get the lolly, what does the child do? He goes... <laughs> and then it comes up and looks to see whether anyone's noticing. <laughs> and then... And then if no one's noticing, it goes back down and does a bit more generally, right? And, and that's what we often do. That's, that's often our rage. Our rage is often this place where we will be in this place where we're really trying to force the other pe person into what we believe that they should do, even though it's totally unloving and it's an addiction. And so what Mary's brought up is very important in this process. Like, to be completely truthful about how you feel means... I feel like actually, come to think of it, you're a woman and you should be making my dinner. And that's hard to face sometimes, those kinds of truths I've found for me. Yeah, and, and then I need to go into, all right, the truth is that a woman doesn't have to make my dinner. Actually, the truth is actually that no one has to make my dinner. Like, no one but myself, in fact, is responsible for my dinner. And the trouble is that I've had a mum who for 18 years has taught me that a woman is responsible for my dinner. All right? So by the way, you mothers out there who've got younger men, boys and girls, um, stop making them dinner. Teach them how to make their own dinner. Like you're teaching them some, stu some stuff that's going to 
they're going to become very obnoxious when they get with their woman or their, you know, their guy, you know, whoever they're going to finish up with, thinking that the woman should expect to have to make dinner for the rest of her life, don't you think? How many of you ladies have made dinner so much that you're now sick to death of even looking at making dinner? Yeah, right, quite. Totally sick to death of it, right? You'd, you'd rather not make a meal for the next 20 years and somebody else have to do it, right? And, and that, this emotion in you came from an expectation of your childhood and an expectation about love and that emotion in you has also created an expectation in the people around you to make dinner for them. So, you know, these are all emotions that need to be addressed. So in that particular issue, if we completely feel how we feel, you'll be surprised sometimes where it goes. Like Mary said, it may go into this place where you actually realise that actually your expectations are actually so totally unloving and off the ball and you've got to do something about them. Or it may take you into this real childlike place of what's happening. Or it may take you into this real tantrum-y place that you need to work your way through to get into the childlike place. Or it may take you into this place where you realise actually that it's got nothing to do with the dinner and got everything to do with your life, your whole life and how hard it feels and you might go into that place yeah? and either way you will need to make some choices and decisions um, to change your life obviously yeah and what is the time by the way 25 minutes 25 okay um, if we can go up to the end Um, it was just a question about, Mary, when you were talking about letting it go in the here and now, um, is a lot of that letting go like the shame and the remorse of the erroneous belief that's come in as well? Yeah, I, well, first, sometimes I have to work through that to get to, the, to actually grieving that I'm not... It just feels like to me, I can't expect this anymore and that feels really... <coughs> I'm unhappy about that. Like... Um, I'm trying to think of one that happened with AJ. I wanted him to protect me. And then I realised that's totally out of harmony with love. And so I had some shame about the fact that I've been demanding that he protect me all of the time. But then I had to grieve the fact that I, uh, no one but me is going to protect, well, God. But I had to feel like I can't expect a man to protect me anymore. That feels really unsafe. I feel really sad about that. So it was really just releasing the expectation that's what but, was for me but then but then again underneath that mary found that there was a lot of emotions about safety from our past and so forth that eventually she connected to does that make sense like so safety so whenever i start talking the truth to a group of people who are angry what would happen is mary would get upset with me does that make sense because she could feel the anger of the audience she straight away feels unsafe and then she feels like i'm putting us in an unsafe place and then I'm, because my role is to protect her, then I've got to get out of this unsafe place. Now, unfortunately, what I do is I just keep talking generally. And, <laughs> and so her addiction isn't met, and so she gets upset about it and angry about that. Does that make sense? And then she had to just feel that in that moment. Can I say, though, that I don't think I'm through that causal emotion about our safety, but I, ha I feel I have given up that addiction. Yes. So that's you one thing that. to bear in mind too, is that every addiction you give up, you'll find the anger that goes along with it dissipates. That's the beauty. You may not get to the causal emotion sometimes with, the, with these addictions, but from that point on, you will no longer have anger when your addiction isn't met. Does that make sense? So many of us have instant anger when our addiction doesn't get met. Instant hurt, instant resentment, you know, all of those instant feelings that come up uh, you know, where we fire up. And those feelings are all about our addictions getting met. When you deal with the addiction and, what, and, the fact, and feel through it emotionally, you'll get to the point where you still may have an underlying causal emotion you need to release, but the actual addiction itself won't drive the angry... There's no addiction anymore, so therefore no angry response. Remember, the addiction is there to mask the causal emotion. That's the purpose of it. So when I'm prepared to acknowledge the addiction feel and feel it, now it's not masking the causal emotion, so now the causal emotion has a chance to actually come up and be felt. 
Is it missing? You wanted to say, Mary? Same thing, was it? Yeah, just the same thing, that now that emotion is far more present for me all of the time, yes. the safety thing. So, yeah, so, so now what happens is if I talk to a group of people who are angry, Mary, instead of being angry with me, is actually crying because these people are angry and she feels terrible about it. Does that make sense? She's now in the causal emotion because the actual addictive behaviour to get out of the causal emotion is no longer present. So the anger can subside as soon as you identify the addiction? No, you have to feel your way through the addiction and the anger will subside. It's very rare for you to notice it intellectually and the anger subsides. You'll find that the anger will keep coming up, keep coming up, keep coming up until you feel the reason why the addiction was created. I'm not getting what I want here. I'm not, you know, when you feel your way through that and release that and cry about that, then the addiction is gone and it's like the addiction disappears. It's like it just goes into nothing. And from that moment on, now the causal emotion is there, ready to be felt at any time, any time it's triggered, and you won't have an addictive response to it. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, thank you. And that's the beauty of doing it too, is that you, you actually get out of anger, you have anger very little, or after you deal with this, you know, like addictions, you'll find you have very little anger in any of your processing. So if there's still anger in your processing, you know there's a lot of addictions in place still. When you get to the place where you've dealt with a lot of the addictions, the anger itself often is completely gone out of all of your processing. So now, like, even though Mary still has the emotion where she's afraid of, for our lives at times, with different interactions that are happening with us and different things that happen and people tell us, and different feelings that people project at us, and she's still afraid of that, she's now not angry with me or with the people doing it anymore. So could there still be some childhood anger present though? Oh, certainly there can be. Yeah, but the adult that's anger. why I said rare rather than non-existent. But, but it should be anger in your work, in your processing work, you need to get to a point where your anger is not even there in a real way. Not that you're intellectually getting out of your anger all the time, but in a real way the anger isn't even present with you anymore. If your anger is present, you know that you're in an addiction still, right? You're in an addiction still when that anger is there. And anger is a beautiful way. And remember I gave a talk about anger being your guide? Anger being your guide, yeah. And, and your anger is a beautiful guide into what your demands and expectations that are unloving are all about. Your anger is all about that. So if you can allow yourself to feel your anger and be truthful about your anger and be truthful about how it's going on, what's going on inside of you about it, be truthful about hurt, because all hurt-based emotions are angry in nature and they're all projections on others. And if you allow yourself to be truthful about them, you'll very rapidly see your own addictions. And when you see your own addictions, then you have a chance of releasing them emotionally. When you release them emotionally, the underlying causal emotion, which is, is sitting there underneath this addiction, now can just naturally percolate up into your awareness and you'll feel it, and it will just naturally come up because there are no longer any blockage, there's no longer any passive, passive blockage or active blockage that you have preventing it from coming to the surface. Addictions are an active blockage to your causal emotion. They are a blockage that we created because we badly want to not feel the causal emotion. So we are totally in activity with our addictions. We, we want these addictions to be met so that we can avoid the causal emotion. Now when you get rid of the addiction, there's now a lot, no longer the desire to avoid your causal emotion either. In that moment, you now, whatever gets triggered just comes up, gets triggered, comes up again, and it gets triggered, comes up again until it's no longer there. And there's nothing to prevent it from coming up anymore. Like, it's the addiction that suppresses it, keeps it down and under control. Yeah. Thanks, Rex. Um, AJ, do we all have to show anger? Is it, I mean, it's not about anger. Well, and frustration, obviously. annoyance. You know, okay. when I talk about anger, remember, mm. I'm always talking about frustration, mild annoyance, mild frustration, all, all the way down to there, and even a feeling of hurt. 
where you're feeling hurt, yeah. it usually indicates there's an addiction in play. Right. Right? Okay. So if you can allow yourself to see that. So it's not always like this boiling rage. Right? And a lot of times it's just this, oh, I'm a bit annoyed there. And off we go. And because we're only a bit annoyed, we sort of bypass the whole system, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. But, but, it's, <laughs> but it's beautiful if we can just tune into that mild annoyance. Because like, when I've done some tuning to my own mild annoyance, I, like, I've been absolutely amazed sometimes of what I've found. Like my, a mild annoyance with some things has turned into this big three-day process of releasing huge amounts of crap about something. Um, and also huge amounts of stuff about where I'm unwilling to act. Like, so I've had a lot of things come up where I've been annoyed with something happening over here, and then I say, ah, yes, 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 yes. This is all about my own refusal to act in harmony with truth and love, and when I do that, that event wouldn't have even happened. You know? So a lot of times I've seen linkages to all sorts of things go by having a look at these addictions that I've had. And, and if you can allow yourself to be completely truthful in the moment, like no matter how dark it seems, you know, I feel like getting a gun and shooting a lot of you, like, you know, that kind of, that feeling, if that feeling is there, voice the feeling and allow yourself not to project it at the people, not to take a gun and shoot the people, but, but to actually feel the feeling of that, the rage of that even, allow yourself to feel it. Because for the majority of us, we are not even in tune with any anger that's within us. La last week um, we gave a talk at uh, Coffs Harbour and at Armadale and there was this lady who asked me a series of questions and I did not answer any of her questions. Instead I said to her a number of things about her own emotions. And every single thing I said in return she told me that she doesn't have that emotion. So, so even if I'm, even if, like with her, I was right 0% of the time. <laughs> now, the truth is that every single thing I said to her, I felt from her. But, but she was so totally switched off to any of the feelings that she was having inside of herself about any issue and telling herself a totally different story that absolutely everything I said, she rejected. And in the end I said, well, why are you asking me questions for? What? There's no point even asking me a question. Like, if you don't feel that I can feel these things from you and reflect them back at you, then what's the point of asking me? And in the end her addiction was that she just wanted to be told what she felt was right. She told me at the start of the conversation that she was blocked emotionally, is what she said. And I told her a lot of reasons why she was blocked emotionally and in the end she told me that every one of those reasons was wrong. And, and, and I s said to her, well, that's why you're blocked emotionally, because you believe that everything that's just been said to you is wrong. And there's not much I can do with that. And this is a trouble here. Oftentimes, we're not even willing to do this step, this first step. We're not willing to just know, to just know our own stuff. So on the other side to demanding dinner, I'm, I'm the p person who is feeling um, frustrated and resentful for making the dinner. Um, so, so you're preparing the dinner feeling like you don't want to be doing this? Yeah, and I've done saying? that for a long time. Okay, so don't do it anymore? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, now there's an addictive emotional reason why you're not going to not do it anymore. Yeah, because something comes in for me here around my father coming home one night. Yeah. And um, he, he, mum had made the dinner, but it wasn't right. And he wanted some mustard, and so he got very violent. And um, we were all sitting in the lounge room, and he threw a, a decanter at the TV and smashed everything up. Yep. And so we went into terror. Yep. And, um, so can you see why you feel like you have to make dinner every so night? So I have a lot of stuff around, you know, the woman having to, you know, make the dinner and anger around, you know, yeah. the man and the terror and the fear of if I don't make it yep. um, the right way, all of that, then he was, he's I gonna can get feel angry. His, his frustration and anger, like uh, even uh, when uh, I make uh, dinner. Uh, 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 stop, stop, stop. Everyone does this, and it's very important to stop doing this. 
you are projecting your father's emotions that are now inside of you yeah. and thinking that he has the same emotions in him and I don't right. feel the same emotions in him. Right. So, okay. so, so you see what we're doing oftentimes is we're projecting what happened when we were children that's now inside of us at our current partner. So what, what we finish up doing is we're actually seeing our partner through the filter of our father. And the truth is there are a very different set of emotions in Bruce than there are in your father. Very, very different. And while you hold on to the emotion that was in your father and, feel, and don't feel it, you are going to think Bruce is like this when he actually is not. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yes. we need to stop doing that. We need to start seeing the truth. And the truth is that actually my father did that. Not Bruce, not my husband, my father. My father did it and I'm afraid of the man, all men now, all men, just every time I think about meals, I've got to make it, I make it, make it, make it. Not because I'm enjoying creating it for my family or for myself, but because I'm afraid the man's just going to rage. Really all you're doing is you're afraid of your father's rage because mm. your father's rage still has an emotional signature right inside of you of mm. this terror that's associated with the man's yeah. rage. You yeah. need to connect to this terror and feel it and release it. And when you do, you'll actually feel Bruce and you go, gee, he doesn't expect me to make dinner at all. Wow. And you might actually enjoy making it occasionally as a result, right? That would be nice for him. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be nice for you too because when you give, you actually feel the point. Yeah. <laughs> when you give with love, there's a lot of joy. That's why in the Bible it actually says there's more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. But only if the gift is coming from your... Heart, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so if you allow yourself to um, feel through that emotionally, you'll feel that it is about your father. And, and by the way, um, every woman here, you must make a meal every night. <laughs> is that to trigger us? No, I'm not saying that to trigger you. It's actually a truth. For yourself. For yourself. Yes. <laughs> and every man here must make a meal every night for himself. Now, now, if you want to cooperate sometimes and make, have one of you do it one night and the other one do it the next night, well, that's a great system. But at the end of the day, we are all personally responsible for ourselves. Now, by the way, many, many people with children go along the lines of, uh, you know, but my child's only five, like, so I've got to cook meals. No, you don't. I was cooking my own meals when I was five, right? And you can too. My mum taught me how to. See, see, as a mum, you're not a mum, you're a teacher. The, the mum is God, and I am the older sister or brother teaching this beautiful child of whose? God's. Teaching this beautiful child how to become self loving and sufficient. That's what I'm doing. So, so what I do is I teach my child. Like I, myself and Mary, we were talking about this a few months ago and we were thinking, yep, by the time the child's five, we want them to have left home. <laughs> they can live in the neighbouring tent. They can live in the neighbouring tent. <laughs> They've got to leave our tent, our tents. So, so, and the reason why that is, is by the time you're five, there is no, and you ask most children who are five, by the way, and they actually love it. Like, I know, Mon Monica, you've been experimenting with this a bit with your children who are six and seven, seven and 12, and they are just loving living in their own environment, their own cooking space, their own cleaning space, most, most of the time. Yeah, except when you've got some emotions at play, then everything else comes in play. But the, the beauty is, is that your children are totally capable of being completely self-sufficient by the age of five. Right? Uh, society doesn't think so, right? But, but I know so, and, and in the end, y you can experiment that. But I'm not saying that they don't, like, they still won't enjoy your love, right? But, uh, but what, what, what we're hoping to create is, that, is children who have their own tent next to us or whatever, a bit further away by the time they're five, they have their own cooking area, they know how to clean up after themselves, they know how to make what's needed, they know how to do all of their stuff with regard to waste, they know how to do all of these things. It's easy to teach them all of these things, by the way. Very easy. They love learning it all. 
You know, they'll put their hand in the poo before you will, trust me. And, <laughs> and, and they all, they, they're pretty happy about all getting muck, messed up and mucked up learning, learning something. So, so, you know, let them do that. And a lot of times it's our own addictions as parents that causes us to want our children to be dependent upon us. Right? What do you get when your children are dependent on you? Oh, I'm a good mother, aren't I wonderful? Oh, I'm a good dad, isn't it great? My, my child needs me, so I feel needed and I feel wanted and all these other things. And all of that is very damaging to us as individuals. In the end, don't we want to be completely free of all of those projective emotions so we can be free to love? In the end, your child at five years of age, by seven years of age, your child can be at one with God, right? Completely self-sufficient, not asking you anything in its life, completely self-sufficient with all of its law of attraction, law of abundance, know how to create everything else in its life by the age of seven. By the time its brain is fully developed intellectually, it also is totally capable of being in that place. Right? It's just that nobody on earth has ever lived that way and so we don't believe it and we think that even when they're 18 they can't stand on their own two feet, right? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, wait for the mic. Thank you. Um, just one question in regards to that. Mm -hmm. um, I have an eight-year-old and we actually sent her to Montessori and we try and teach her all of that. Mm -hmm. And I see myself as quite controlling when it comes to her nutrition. Uh -huh. So my concern is in teaching her to be independent, when does my role come in where, or does it not come in at all? No. Because Why would it? Because she could eat veggie sandwiches all day. Yes, she could. 24-7. She's allowed to eat lollies all day 24-7 yeah. too. So my question is... <laughs> Can she buy them though? Okay. So that's where my control goes. Well, my... Your control? I know. <laughs> I'm not controlling everyone. <laughs> you are. You just said you were. <laughs> I am, I am. But anyway, the, the true question is that, um, you know, with regard to our children, you don't have to buy anything for them if you don't want to. That includes buying ice cream, lollies, and all these other things that they may want. You've got to deal with the emotional reason, again, your addiction as to why you want to get these things for them, even if they're bad for them. Also, if you deal with your addictions regarding food, and then have children. You'll find your children have no addictions regarding food, which means they'll automatically be attracted to food that benefits their body. They'll automatically be attracted to fruit and vegetables. They will dislike meat intensely. You, you'll notice that they won't even touch meat at all. They won't, um, they won't often have lollies or, or any of those things because it makes them feel sick. And they'll actually be in a space where they manage their own food. And the more you experiment with these things, the more you'll realise that what I'm saying is true about them. The problem that we have as parents is we, the emotion we have as a parent is, I've got to look after my child's diet. That emotion creates my child wanting to rebel against the diet I create for it, automatically, to trigger our emotion, because our emotion is an expectation that's an addiction. What's my addiction? Ah. Oh, Diet is important. I've got to look after their body. Why do you got to look after their body and not their soul? If you focus on their soul, they'll look after their body. You know, there's all these false beliefs we have about bringing up children, even with regard to what they eat. And those false beliefs create the environment that we've now got to manage their diet. And when we don't manage their diet, they go and have lollies all day. Now, what I did with one of my sons, he had lollies all day. Um, what he used to do, Caleb, my son Caleb, he used to, and Trisha remember this, this was when he was about 15. He used to get a stash of all of the money that he earned would be spent on chocolate. Right? And he'd get a whole stash of it, right? And he'd pile it up underneath one of his bedside drawers. Like he had this humongous stash of chocolate. And it was fine by me. Right? And when he started coming out and all these pimples and everything, I just reminded him that it might have something to do with the chocolate that he was eating, right? Is he coming out and all these pimples and everything else? And then sometimes he'd come out and say, oh, I feel really sick, eh? <laughs> what have you eaten by a chance? You know, oh, I just had a whole, you know, 300 gram block of chocolate. <laughs> things like that. And, and after a while, he started realising, oh, hang a sec, I want to eat different things. And by the time he left home, he, he was actually cooking for himself and eating food that actually benefits his body and he was into his own fitness and everything else just because he wanted to, not because I wanted him to. I had to release the fact, I had to let go of my addiction to him eating the chocolate, or not eating it. Well, 
Um, with me, it's the opposite. <laughs> I actually try not to buy sweets. We, we don't actually have a lot of them in our cupboard, but I'm feeling guilty. So <laughs> what happens is there's a... Um, so your children are just going to trigger that guilt in you. Okay. So let yourself feel it as a law of attraction as a parent. So why do you feel guilty? Oh, because the other kids are not having it, they have it, you know. And that triggers something in your childhood of feeling different to the kids around you. And, you know, there's all sorts of things as to why you feel guilty in that particular situation. So feel it. Let yourself feel it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, you've had enough of me today, I'm sure. And um, with regard to addictions, can I just make one further comment, and that is this. If you have the courage to face up to all of your addictions you will find that your emotional processing work becomes so simple and easy to do because every single moment you'll be able to feel the underlying emotion because an addiction isn't preventing it from flowing. So if you have the courage to face your addictions and your expectations in a really positive manner, and pray about them and really work on them, you will find that many of these emotions that you're really struggling to get to feel will come up just as a, as in an organic manner and a very natural way. So my suggestion is to just let yourself ponder about that at least, about the addictions and expectations you have. Myself uh, uh, and Mary will be here again tomorrow and the talk tomorrow will be relationship with God and we're talking about the quality of faith. And, uh, and so I want to spend a bit of time with you about that. It's one of the most important qualities you can develop with God. And so um, I'm sure if, if you'd like to come, you're invited to come. But thank you so much for your time and your donations today. Of course. Thank you.